Hello, hello, and welcome. We are bringing you number seven, the seventh Crystal Talk Show presented by yours truly, Kyle Russell of crystalconcentrics.com. And if you are tuning in now, I know there's a little bit of a delay. Please feel free to uh, make a statement of greetings in the chat box. Maybe let us know where you're from. Help yourself to asking any questions. I had a few emails that came in sort of last minute today, and I didn't have a chance to prepare for them. So if you are on the show and you are one of those people who emailed me, think of how to phrase your question live in the Q&A chat. So greetings. Oh my goodness. Hello. We've got Kobe and Sarah. This is so cool. Um, I have got so much in store for you this time. I had originally waited nine weeks before the last talk show, and then now it's been exactly four weeks to the date, July 16 till August 16. And I want you to know that even though this is a fun live event, it is a lasting educational resource. We cover so many cool topics that you will definitely want to watch these even afterwards. And the good news is if you've registered and you're not available that night, it's tiring, you know, you've gone to sleep or uh, you're in another part of the world, all you have to do is click to watch the replay. We've got more people. Tom is here. Kathy Rose. Wow, this is great. I'm so glad that all of you have joined me. I want to share with you the pendant that I was wearing today because it has a lot of weight to it. This is a Cicote meteorite, and it looks a lot like a bird sort of flying in this direction. Now, the Cicote meteorite is the only meteorite hit that was... Uh, sort of filmed and watched in real time. This was the first one back in, I think, 47, 1947 in Siberia. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, there were photographs of whole forests flattened because of the impact of this particular media hit. And the reason I was wearing this today is that I needed a little bit of extra grounding to make my way through today. I've been at work for eight hours in a row. A bunch of those were live to the public. As some of you know who are in the Boston area, our shop, the Portal Crystal Gallery, opened in June, June 8th. And I've realized it's taken two months for certain customers to come out. We were supported through the shutdown by a lot of serious collectors. But people who come in to buy a casual tumbled stone, children, teenagers, those are the types of people we're getting now after two months of being open. So it just goes to show that it's all in the process. Uh, hi, Sue. Hi, Jen. Maria. This is all good. Um, I have more things to show you. I usually like to start with jewelry, mine, and other cool ones. This is a particularly wild one called Awihi Blue Opal from Oregon. And look at how that looks just like a, uh, a sort of Asian scenic painting. It's incredible. This one really feels like a one of a kind. And I'm really excited to bring it and have hope of putting it on my website. So my website has 250 odd items on it, but they've been the same items for almost a year because my tech guy was not able to stay on top of it. And we are now researching a total overhaul, a whole new way of uploading product which will hopefully make it easier so that next time we have a talk show like this, I will be able to report a hundred or more new items going up on the website. Hi, Bridget, Colleen. Oh, Colleen. Colleen, I think is the one who had sent me that email. So if you can formulate your question, actually, I'm remembering it now. It was about grids. You wanted to know about pairing of stones in grids. And I call grids constellations myself. 
And just for those of you who may not be familiar with grids, grids are layouts of stones that are designed to produce some sort of energetic uh, wave generation. And that means to make something happen in the world or to magnify or manifest some sort of intention that you have. And one of the things that I think is useful to think about is something that I teach when I lead meditations, and that is the idea of having a um, harmonic meditation or a harmonic grid. So in the harmonic grid, you can take stones that might have slightly different functions and you put them together in order to create a kind of a chord between different energies that will produce a certain type of outcome. So say, for example, you want to have a grounding stone in there as well as an ascension stone. So the ascension stone is there to try to lift up the vibration and the grounding one is not trying to hold it down or tether it, but sort of root it so that you don't get unfounded or the grid doesn't get ungrounded. So that's the function of that. We've got overload risks question. Tom is asking, is it possible to have an overload with a grid? And the way I'm going to answer that is to ask you to remember in the crystal books that you have, when they show crystal layouts, the laying on of stones on a person, and you see like 30 different stones on that person. That is an overload and a very bad idea. I find that completely overkill and not necessary. The key in grids, because I don't even make uh, sort of store-bought grids uh, myself. I make my constellations and I usually use them for meditations or in a healing session. And I think that few less is more. So pick, choose wisely and then only use what you need. Don't go overboard. So another pendant that I want to show you. Well, actually, I'm going to use a pendant to get into a kind of a story. So this here, anyone, I don't know if with the delay, um, whether you can see what this is and anyone can make a guess. It's kind of hard for us to do real-time guessing when uh when when there is a slowdown so what i'm going to do is i'm going to tell you what this is this is a boulder opal so the boulder part is the part that looks like a rock and then the opal is a little vein that runs through it and i've just shown you a great pendant that's representative of that boulder opal thing going on and you can buy also pieces like this this shows you that it's a boulder, but it has a sort of sheet or layer of opal inside of it. So that's what a boulder opal looks like. And in this situation, it was carved into a gorgeous horse. So maybe I'm gonna face, whoops, I'm gonna face that the other way. Sorry for the big noise. I'm gonna face that the other way, and you're gonna see that there are little veins of opal in this horse's head, including a little inset piece of opal right in this horse's eye. Hey, Sherry, Allie, cool. Um, so those are what op uh, boulder opals look like, and they come from Australia. Now, you can get a uh, solid opal from Australia, but I wanted to show you a solid opal from Ethiopia. Look at all of that flash. So this is what we call a floater. A floater is when there's no break points. It's sort of terminated all the way around, even though this is round and soft. It is, uh, it is a floater, and it's incredibly rare and unusual. And I'm pretty pleased that I have it and uh, able to share it with you as a counterpoint to the boulder opal, which is sort of the lowest end available opal. And then this, which is a super duper specimen, is more on the high end of opals. Now, there's a type of stone that I don't care that much about. And um, I don't care about it because there are other stones in this color scheme 
that I like more, that are more plentiful, available, affordable. And the stone that I'm talking about is tourmaline. So this tourmaline here is very, very cool for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's got a kind of bluish green sheen to it. And the second thing that's interesting about it is that it is on the back of a milky, smoky quartz. So that is quite an unusual show and tell item I wanted to give you a chance to look at because somebody went on my site today and purchased this. It's a green opal in milky quartz, which is very, very sweet. So I am gonna be on the prowl for more tourmalines. I've got lots of black tourmaline because I find black tourmaline very unique and there's nothing else that does what black tourmaline does as well as it. So I, uh, I, I, I one day will get a real super duper tourmaline crystal, but right now I've got other stones that uh, satisfy that need for green. And one of them is, of course, green fluorite or you could have blue fluorite. But I want to tell you about uh, one of my favorite um, green stones, which is, of course, Moldavite. So Moldavite is a tektite, and I'm going to show you a very large tektite. So this is called a dumbbell when, uh, when there are these Im meteoric impacts that create tektites. The, uh, they hit the earth and they melt everything in a huge explosion and they form a volcanic glass which shoots up into the air and dries before it falls. So you get discrete pieces like this that formed in the air and then they hit the ground without breaking and they are called tektites. Now, you may be familiar with um, Apache Tear Obsidian, which was formed in exactly the same way, except the volcanic molten action for obsidian comes from within the earth, whereas with a tektite, it comes from outside of the earth. It's an extraterrestrial impact. And I'm going to show you a nice round ball of black tektite. Before we move on to our friend, the green tektite, I'm gonna show you an extra big piece here. This, you think it's just like that, but in fact, you see that this has a lot more texture to it, much finer texture to it. And if you put a light through it, which I'm going to attempt to do with my phone here, then while I'm holding this seemingly black item, I put the light up behind it. And let me see if I can get it maybe on one of the, there you go. You can see that in fact, it's green. It's green Moldavite. It's the only green tektite on the planet. And it's also special because it can be carved and faceted into jewelry. So it's a gem quality tektite. Now, this is an enormous piece. This is over 50 grams. So 50 grams is a very, very unusual kind of denomination for you to find a uh, Moldavite in. And uh, what happens sometimes is you get a variation on the theme where you don't even have to show a light through it in order to indicate that it's green looking. See, this one doesn't have a light through it, but it's definitely much lighter. If I compare it to this other 50 gram plus piece, you can see one is much lighter and the other is much darker. And a lot of Moldavite looks black until you put a light through it. Okay, so um, I call this lighter um, form of Moldavite, I call it Emerald Moldavite because of that. And I'm going to show you uh, one of the absolute prize 
additions to my collection. And what happens is because I'm kind of out front in terms of what I'm interested in and what I'm buying, uh, often I'll be an early adopter of a certain type of stone before those who know me end up catching on to it. Uh, for example, I got an email today from somebody who's really interested in Lemurians. And obviously I've been working with Lemurians for a long time and Sherry, who's hopefully still on the line here, is a Lemurian specialist. She has 40 Lemurians, which is quite astounding. Um, but I have dozens and dozens of them that range from $20 to over $1,000. And what's happening is that most of my customers and most of my sales are say $300 and below. But what I'm moving towards is trying to turn people on to pieces that are much more like the Moldavite that I sold in Tucson this year, which was a different version of this. So check this out. This is what we call a Besed Nise Moldavite. And they also call it a hedgehog because it's very, very spiky. It's spiky and textured and has little ridges and rivulets and valleys and mountains all over it. And uh, this is a superstar piece that if you're interested in this type of thing, obviously reach out to me. Uh, my email is obvious. It's Kyle at the website that's on the uh, image here, crystalconcentrics.com. So this was formed by the same explosive power of the impact, but for some reason, you get some that are spiky like this and some that are very flat like that. And this is another one that's black, but will show up uh, green if you put a light through it. In fact, I bet you'll want me to do that. So here I go. I'm going to put the flashlight on, and then I'm going to hold this up. Then I'm going to put the light through it. So there you go. That's what I'm talking about. The whole thing lights up. And that is what is amazing about Moldavite. It's got an incredibly uh, rich and intricate texture, but it also is two-tone. It starts black like this, and then it goes green when it has a light in it. Uh, one of the things that I'm super excited about, in addition to now meditating with some of these bigger Moldavites, and the verdict is really out as to whether bigger is better. Uh, as I say in my book, which some of you know is coming out this Fall. I'm shooting for Thanksgiving and we've got, I started with 13,000 words and I've gone up to 45,000 words. And I started with the 80 good photographs I had in my crystal meditation and affirmation card deck. And I'm now up to 200 photos to choose from. I've been doing lots of photo shoots with my photographer, and we have got some incredible pieces captured. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to chime in. We're using the chat, and I will endeavor to answer those questions as, uh, as we go along. But I want to show you one of the crystals that I photographed, and that's this incredible cluster. So this is a cactus amethyst from South Africa. It is purple, and it's got an incredibly pleasing formation. It just shoots out in all directions, and it's got a very uh, harmonious spread of uh, crystals coming up. And I wanted to talk to you during this show about an important distinction that I make between cactus quartz and spirit quartz. So they both come from the same place, but the cactus quartz is distinctive because it has all that sort of pineapple-y spikiness around the side, but then the actual points are defined. There are real points coming out of here, A and B. 
And so what I wanted to show you, first of all, this is a, a yellow version. You could call it a citrine uh, um, cactus quart if, quartz if you wanted to, but it's clearly the coating and not interior. Now a true citrine has to be colored from the inside, not the outside. And what I've always wondered, because this has a kind of a sheen on it, it used to have more of a sheen than it does now. I think this is natural. But some people think that to get this color, they put some sort of coating on it like the Aura Quartzes. Now, what I want to do next is show you the distinction between a Cactus Quartz here. I'm going to use this because it's great big points. And this one over here, which I call an am a cactus ametrine, it's got purple and it's got yellow. And what I like about this stuff and what makes it distinctive and what makes it spirit quartz instead of cactus quartz is that there are no big points peering out. It's all, it's not quite druzy. It's not small enough to be druzy, which is almost like sandstone, little tiny, tiny glittery crystals. But when you have spirit quartz, it's a little bit bigger, but they cover the entire crystal and they don't let the crystal out. Here's another example. You see, it's a little sheen of terminations that covers the entire cluster. And that is what makes a spirit quartz. I hope you like the flowers in the background. That was an inspiration to bring some uh, plant life in along with all this stone life. Now I'm going to answer a question from Lauren here who asks, what are appropriate ways to handle broken stones? I've heard mixed answers of salt bath and reuse versus just returning it to the earth and getting a new one. Now I happen to have a YouTube video on my channel, which is Crystal Concentrics, just like my website. If you go to YouTube and you get into my channel and hopefully subscribe, I suggest you click on playlists and sort through all the different types of playlists, which are a great way that I have organized the content on the YouTube channel. And one of the videos that you will find is about what to do with broken crystals. And the suggestions that you listed there are not uncommon ones. People glue them back. You can glue them back if you can stand to have a uh, glue in the crystal. Some people can't. Uh, you can leave it out in nature and then retrieve it. You can use the parts separately. Um, salt, I never ever recommend, rec recommend because it is corrosive. And um, so I don't think that's such a good idea. Um, I have actually a huge lesson I want to give you. And there's more Moldavite I'm going to show you later on. Um, because I have some crazy, crazy pendants from Europe that I got that are so beautiful, you're not even going to believe it. They are Moldavite, and you definitely want to hang in to see those. But I have a sort of big topic I wanted to tackle. And to tackle it, I drew a picture for you. There's my picture. So over here we have a crystal. This is a crystal that I drew this evening. And then over here on the other side, you have a sort of six-sided crystal, in this case of ruby. And the things that I want to talk to you about, I'm going to leave this, or maybe I'll move it over here. Maybe I'll move it like this. So you can see it while I'm talking about the stuff. Oh, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, so definitely check out that video. There may be some more ideas there. And also the comments in the YouTube videos often have some extra content from viewers and from my responses, sort of fleshing out certain contexts, certain uh, concepts. Now, the concept that we're going to talk about here is the idea of record keepers and trigons or trigonic. And the fourth concept is cathedral. So. I'm going to explain it all with this simple, simple picture. So a record keeper is a raised triangle 
on the face of a crystal. So it has to be on the flat part here. It can't be on the sides. If you see a raised triangle on the face of a crystal, it is a record keeper. Down here, if you see an indentation, it's a downward pointing triangle on the face of the crystal. And that has been called a trigon by other people, which makes total sense because that's a geometric shape, a trigon, three sides. My belief is that both of these could be called record keepers and should be called record keepers because I save the word trigon for a different concept. And that is when I talk about something being trigonic. So trigonic means it has a theme of triangles or pyramids. And I happen to have here a trigonic, let's try to get that light catching there. Oh, I'm working on it. There we go. I'm working on it. There we go. That kind of captures that the whole surface of this ruby is covered with trigonic shapes. They're not quite record keepers, but they're definitely trigonic. And the other use of the word trigonic is to describe the cathedral siding that you see on the sides of crystals. So this, this type of stuff, if it's on the side of a crystal, it is not a record keeper, even though you may be tempted to call it that because it is three-sided and it is raised. And I am going to show you some cathedraling on some quartzes that should knock your socks off. Look at that. Look and marvel at what's going on there. Those are not record keepers, but they are trigonic. And this is a cathedraled quartz. It's all down the sides. It's all terminated like that. Now I'll give you another look at this tasty, tasty view. And this is a great big Bolivian cathedral ametrine that I wanted to show you. And I have another one, which is basically like a red cap amethyst, which some people call a super seven. It's coated in iron and that makes it red. And here it is. Let's see if we can get the angles right on this. Oh, I'm struggling. There we go. There we go. Now, that should definitely knock your socks off as an experience of trigonic cathedraling on a quartz. So that's sort of like, it's a bit of a finale uh, that you would say for the end of a fireworks show, but uh, I wanted to show it to you because it's very, very cool. And I have another example. This is a cathedraled praise quartz. So some of you may have seen this before. I'm going to try like heck to catch the light. Oh, boy, we're having trouble. Well, I'll just bring it close to you. You see what I'm saying? It's all cathedral, all down the sides. And you see the points here. It's just fantastic. So this is a cathedral praise quartz. Incredible condition, pristine tip from Inner Mongolia. Exceedingly rare. So that is, a, is, is another example of a trigonic cathedral experience. So definitely chime in if you have any more questions, because there's more stuff I want to show you. I think I have some more pendants I want to show you but I'm going to get to those Moldavites now. So here is this very cool jewelry that I have acquired. It's Moldavite, which is set in what looks to be sterling roots. These are little tendrils that reach around and 
contain the crystal. It's not quite a crystal, it is a moldavite. And this is a, an intact piece, another floater that exploded from this impact 15 million years ago, but, um, but it's just plain smaller than some of the other ones. And then there's this one, <coughs> which I call the Big Mama. Uh, that is gorgeous. I just love the way that the roots come right down over it and hold it. Um, and it goes all the way around, and it's a great big moldavite. I think together the setting and the stone weigh 20 grams, which is definitely on the larger side for a moldavite. And recently I've just priced up. Oh, hi, Lynn. Yes, you were in the shop. That's a good thing to do. Um, I've actually, I've got to tell you all, I'm sorry that for those who are local, I've been open only from 1 till 4 p.m. And that was originally because of the pandemic. And I wanted to sort of focus people's interests so that they would all show up at that time. And also wearing a mask for three hours in a row. And I know people do it for eight hours a day. But it's, it's something that does get old. And you eventually want to take your mask off. And I keep my mask on. And everyone who comes in the store obviously wears a mask. And it's just what we have to do, but it makes it less onerous if I'm only doing it three hours. And it also gives me time earlier in the day and later in the day to deal with my online interests. I've got people contacting me constantly about one type of stone or another type of stone. And since I go deep into all the different varieties, I have got pieces that uh, that, that would show you a lot of dimension, say fluorite, lots of fluorite. Uh, I made a video tonight, actually, right before this talk show, all about rainbow obsidian. I'm not even going to show you the rainbow obsidian, but I am going to be posting a video to YouTube about it. So keep an eye out for that. Hello, Suzanne. I'm glad you got on. Um, this here is the last of these beautiful, beautiful little tendrils all down and holding this, what we call a drop. This is a drop uh, moldavite, and it's got beautiful color. I'll give you another little um, glimpse. Sorry if it gets a little too brilliant there. There we go. Oh, man. That's it. That's the color that we're looking for. Oh, man. There we go. There we go. So um, so another two-tone experience from black to green. So I'm very fond of those, and I'm also fond of a couple of other pendants I wanted to show you. This one right here, this is moss agate. Very cool moss agate, and you'll notice the wire wrapping is quite exquisite all the way around it. And we have started using a different metal than sterling for all of our silver pendants. We are using something called argentium, which has a higher silver content than sterling and does not tarnish. So that is a very, very exciting thing for us to be able to start doing. Another type of jewelry that I just got back, I want to show it to you. Um, I had bought a bunch of purple jade. It is from Turkey. And these are some sweet little purple jades. I had gotten these square beads, and I sent them to my guy to be turned into earrings. And they're very gorgeous, sweet, um, sort of, they're jadeite, actually, supposedly 60% jadeite. I don't know what the rest of it is, but it's a natural blend that occurs in Turkey. And uh, it's gorgeous stuff. And I want to contrast it with this purple jade here. So you see one is a more muted color and the other is a bright, bright purple. And the reason why it's a bright, bright purple is that it is dyed or treated to become bright like that. And that is a Burmese treated jade that gets to that gorgeous, gorgeous lavender color, but 
you can get a more muted and natural version of it this way. So that is a kind of a cool thing. We're, uh, I'm going to be looking for uh, pen, uh, pendulum chains, but this works really nice. It's a full chain and a full necklace, but you could certainly use it as a pendulum. And this is purple jade again. I like the way that's shaking. It feels like it's mesmerizing me as I'm watching it. Um, so I wanted to talk about that, turn you on to the purple jade. I haven't talked about green or nephrite jade in a while, and I'm going to be uh, tempted to do that soon. When I was talking about cactus quartz and spirit quartz, I wanted to also bring in um, candle quartz. So candle quartz also has this cathedraling on the side. It's from Madagascar. Um, and it's kind of cool stuff also. Uh, it doesn't cactus as, as hard as this type of stuff, where only the point is sticking out from all the bristly, uh, prickly, smaller points. Um, but uh, this is sort of a cross. I don't know if it's a cross, but it's a, it's a, a variant, an offshoot uh, that is called Candle Quartz from Madagascar. And it's nice if you can get a good piece of that. Oh, when I one thing I did this weekend, which I'm extremely proud of, is that I priced all my smaller Moldavites. And I got this one, which is a little emerald moldavite for only 38 dollars and i sold it immediately um so it's waiting to be mailed off i go to the post office once or twice a week because people are asking for cool stuff and another piece that i'm about to sell to somebody in japan of all places is this this is what is called a pink amethyst however Pink amethyst is usually very brittle. They come in these all quartz geodes and they break them open and they often fall apart. But occasionally you get large and well-formed crystals like this. And I would call this rose quartz if I didn't know that rose quartz crystallizes and has a totally different look than this. Um, so... Uh, so it's not rose quartz, although it is certainly a pink quartz and probably feels better called a pink quartz than a pink amethyst because it really doesn't look a lot like an amethyst. Some of the crystal formations resemble amethyst, but not all of them. So that may cover all the stones that I have for you today in our rapid fire show and tell experience. If you have any questions, either now you want to ask, you can also send them to me. I would love to hear what they are and address them somehow, either through email to you or Facebook messaging or back on the next radio show, which is going to be in September. And um, I will make sure to have more cool things to show you. I think we went over what? Tektites. We talked about the black tektites and the green tektites, which means moldavite. We showed you how moldavite is two-tone and how it's formed and how it can be made into gorgeous, unusual jewelry. We talked about the green tourmaline and we talked about cactus quartz versus spirit quartz and later brought in candle quartz to that equation. And then we talked, oh, someone really liked this hedgehog piece. Well, guess what? I'm going to show you that I happen to be sitting on three. One, two, three. This is the biggest one here. Then comes the next one here, and then comes the third one, well, here. So just so you know, they don't sit in shops and churn these out. Um, and I have a friend who gets shown hundreds of Moldavites to pick through. And I personally 
have, um, you know, I was just asked, well, I'm going to just finish my other point. Um, what I do is I pick through my Moldavites very carefully, especially once they get bigger. I like this, which I call kind of the drop formation or leaf formation. The next type that I like a lot is called the, um, you know, anything round or anything sort of wholesomely shaped like that. Um, and then I like the big drops like this. Those are the shapes that I love. Now I had a question, uh, was the purple jade necklace for sale? Yes, it is for sale. You can, I can follow up and you can follow up and we'll come together because I got all kinds of gorgeous purple jade for you, including an all beaded necklace of it. But the question, do I have an example of a record keeper? I don't. The best example I've got is this sad little photo. Um, it either has to stick out. It's either an innie or an outie. That's what a record keeper looks like. They're usually too small to show practically on a web broadcast. So uh, we're going to have to leave that one alone for another time. I know in my book, I'm going to have great pictures of record keepers. So you'll want to tune into that. Oh, we've got a friend named Jeff online. He likes that drop. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. I got it from a very, very good friend of mine. In any case, I'm going to sign off now because I try to keep these to around 40 minutes. And you have, I hope, been interested in tuning in for next time, which is going to be in September. Make sure you're on my mailing list. Go to the website, crystalconcentrics.com. And once you're registered for one of these talk shows, I try to keep you informed every time there is a new one and give you the live and replay link. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Any additional questions, write me after, and uh, we'll see you soon. Keep watching the YouTube videos. Look at and open your newsletters. Thanks so much. Till later. Bye-bye. How do I? There we go. Talk to you soon.